Thanks so much for being here this morning. Um, we're here as part of the Spring 2012 Common Read events, where 950 Queensborough Community College students are reading to Kill a Mockingbird, and 950 local area high school students are reading the text at the same time. This is the 14th of 15 events that we're holding within these three weeks, where we're hoping you can make connections across the disciplines. What does that mean? Well, quite frankly, you're reading, a book usually in your English class, but today we're going to take a look, with the help of Dr. Jane Mikowski, at child development in the midst of turmoil. That's not something you would or ordinarily have when you're reading a text in English. So we're hoping that you can make connections through these events, uh, either via history, or we've had some theater students present, we've had a Queensboro production, we've shown a documentary, so we've had so much offered for you, we hope that you have taken advantage of these things. Yes, I see you yes in the last grade. Um, after this event, which runs today until 11.30, we're going to have the presentation of the documentary in this very room, if you'd like to stay. And it's exploring the story behind the novel of To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper Lee stopped giving interviews shortly after she won the Pulitzer Prize for the book. And so no one's really spoken to her, but we get a look at her through the eyes of her sister, who in the video is 99 years old and still a practicing lawyer, and also some of the people in uh, the area of Alabama where she currently lives and where she grew up. So we hope that you'll be able to make that. Uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Jankowski for today's event. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to offer you today a perspective on the novel from a psychologist. You know, certainly you don't maybe think of psychologists reading novels often, and a lot of times we do so maybe only for pleasure. But certainly when you stand back from the novel and you take a look at it, there are some very interesting comments that are made about child development and certainly about family issues. And that's what I'd like to talk about today because certainly we can say a lot about what makes a child a child, if you will, how, what makes their development over time. You know, I chose this title, To Kill a Mockingbird, Child Development in the Midst of Turmoil. You know, certainly when you look at the structure of that book itself, certainly you can see all of the turmoil, turmoil toward the end of the book. You know, there's a lot of racial issues, certainly there's the trial, and certainly that's a lot of turmoil in the kid's life. But if you look at the basic structure of the book, don't misunderstand something too. Some of it is turmoil, but also that first half of the book, as you're reading it, you notice the routine in a child's life, how a lot of things are pretty good for kids and a lot of things are very usual, which also helps to foster child development. So we're going to touch on some of those issues as I go through the talk. If anybody has any questions as we go to, don't be, uh, please raise your hand, I'd be happy to answer them. What I'm, doing for, uh, what I'm going to begin with today is, first of all, just to give you an idea of what psychology is. For those of you, perhaps, that have never had a psychology course, I'll kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from and how I'm viewing the novel. And so certainly, I'm looking at the novel through the lens of a psychologist. You know, when I work with people in English and literature, when I work on learning communities, a lot of times when I work with Professor Denbo, she'll always mention that we look at something through a lens, and that's a nice way to put it. You know, we bring our own perspective, we bring our own training, we bring our own ideas to the novel. And certainly each one of us do that, and I do that. And I bring my perspective as a psychologist to the novel and how I look at it. You know, certainly the first question that we ask, what is psychology? What is my perspective? What do I spend a lot of time in the classroom talking about? What is it that I study? And certainly, if we look at psychology, a very nice uniform definition, one that you see talked about a lot, simple, brief, and yet descriptive, is that psychology is the study of human behavior and mental processes, okay? Now certainly, you could jump very quickly from this point, and you could say, okay, that's nice. But 
remember something too, I always like to point out, there are simple, a couple of things that separate psychology from what you and I do on a daily basis. You know, we'll always say everybody likes to observe human behavior. Everybody's interested in it. You know, certainly one of my favorite examples is that when you travel on the trains or on the buses, you're always listening to somebody else's conversation, it seems, on their cell phones. Listen to those conversations. What are people talking about most of the time? Other people. They're trying to figure out somebody's behavior. They're trying to figure out a relationship. They're trying to figure out what to do. And so everybody's interested in human behavior. But the one thing I think that separates psychology from the other disciplines is that we hopefully study it. And study always implies careful observation, very systematic, very structured observation. And certainly in psychology, you take a course in psychology, you study psychology, a lot of your time is focused on understanding how you study the behavior. So when we're going to look at the behavior of the finches and we're going to look at, you know, Jem and Scout and that, we're going to look at it through the perspective of a psychologist. Now, in general, in this, in, you know, certainly the year 2012 and for a number of years, psychology has prided itself on using the scientific method. Now, the scientific method has three crucial parts. Hopefully you're familiar with this, but the three crucial parts are theory, hypothesis, and data, okay? That's how we do psychology, and that's how science is done. Now, hopefully you remember from many of your science classes that, you know, you begin with a theory. And we will commonly say that a theory is a broad explanation. A broad explanation. You're trying to understand some phenomenon, something that you're interested in, something perhaps that you would like to explain, and so you go out there and you read theory about it. And certainly at the present time too, you're going to go out there too, you're going to read research. You're going to see what people have done because if you're interested in some aspect, maybe of human behavior, maybe it's group behavior, maybe it's some aspect of social behavior in children, not only do you want to know current theory, but you want to know current research. So well, that's good. After you've spent a huge amount of time online at the library, you're reading continuously, you're going to then make a hypothesis. Now a hypothesis, most people know, will say it's an educated guess, okay? Fair enough. Or a better term instead of an educated guess, the one I prefer, is a prediction, okay? You're going to make a prediction. You're going to expect something, and then after you expect something, you form your research question, well then you're going to gather some data. You're going to make, in other words, observations. Because, you know, that's the heart of science. Certainly what you have to do, if you have a hypothesis, you need some data to support it. And so the one thing you're going to do, you're going to conduct a number of studies, or maybe one study, and you're going to see, do I have data to support my hypothesis? Now you may be wondering at this point, what does this have to do with the novel? Well, consider something. This is the way we typically do science. But now when we have this novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know what we're kind of doing now? In a sense, we have the data in front of us. We have the novel, we have the book. And it's filled with observations. Observations that Lee made about how the kids developed through time. And now, in order to understand the behavior a little bit more, we're going to work in reverse. We're not gonna go from theory, hypothesis, data. We're gonna, we have the data, now we're going to maybe make a hypothesis, or better yet, we're going to look to see what theory in psychology has to tell us about how the children developed. And so today I want to present a theory as one possible way to understand the behavior of these children in the novel. You know, certainly when you look at the novel, and frankly, it's a very enjoyable novel. I've read it a couple times myself, and certainly I'm glad that Ms. Madeira asked me to do this because it's a very rich piece of literature. 
You know, it's amazing. You read it once, you read it twice. I went back and started reading a third time, and I'm beginning to see things I really didn't even see the first two times. So I can see clearly why it's considered a classic. It's a great novel. And certainly, if I were to sit here and talk with you, each of us would come away with some themes that are present in the novel. And I think when we look at what's there, most of us would agree that there are some themes that really, uh, really stick out, that are really prominent. If I asked you one theme that you would see, I think a lot of people would say there's a theme of inequality, okay? Inequality in the way people are treated based on their race, their ethnicity, in the southern U.S. in the 1930s. That is a prominent theme that's throughout the novel. I mean, you hear it in terms of the way people are referred to, the names that they're called, the words that are said, the behaviors that are expected, the things that aren't allowed. And it's constantly this theme of inequality. And what's so interesting about that theme is you see how it runs through everyday life. It's just part of the human experience for that time period. So that's a very, very prominent theme. A second theme that's inescapable, the inequalities in the justice system. Prominent, prominent. You know, when you see Atticus trying to defend Tom Robinson, you see what he's facing. As the book goes on, you see that he's fighting an uphill battle. You see that he knew there was a good chance he'd lose. It's interesting, you know, at the trial, you see how Jem and Scout are saying, you're going to win, you're going to win. And Atticus is very reserved. He said, no, I'm, you know, we have to wait and see. And clearly you know that the people in the courtroom and even Atticus are not surprised, that they expected this. But nonetheless, you know, Atticus makes the point, it's worth the fight. And another inescapable theme, I think, is something about the 20th century in a more global, uh, perhaps, um, outlook. And that is the 20th century is a time of change, okay? You know, it's interesting. If you remember in the courtroom, there was a scene where the, uh, the uh, attorney for the prosecution is talking about Tom Robinson and how he refers to him and how he refers to Mayella. And if you remember how upset Dill becomes at the difference in which he talks to the people, how he's very condescending to Tom, and how Dill steps back and says it isn't right. And they're having this conversation. And certainly even out on the lawn, they're talking with Mr. Raymond. And then they go home at night, and Jem and Scout are talking about the inequality or the unfairness of the whole thing. And so there already is a current here that's present, that looking ahead to the future, things are going to change because people's attitudes are changing. And that, too, is a very prominent theory. Or not a theory, but an idea that's throughout. Now, certainly any of these themes you could discuss at length about. If I were a sociologist, if I were a social psychologist, I'm a developmental psychologist inter interested in children, but if I were a social psychologist, I could perhaps talk at length about this. Or certainly a sociologist would be well equipped to address these issues. These are important, they're interesting. But I'm going to focus on the one that is in my area of interest. Okay. And that is, I'd like to focus on the children in this novel. And not even so much because I want to focus on these three children but I think it has relevance to each one of us, and I think it has relevance to all children. Because children develop in a context, okay? It doesn't matter if the kids are in 1930s southern U.S., or in the year 2012 in New York, or somewhere 3,000 miles away. Children develop in a context. Children are born, they're born into a family, and a society, and a culture, and a community, and we'll see each one of those things impacts the child's development. And certainly, as I mentioned to you, yes, there's turmoil. I think in most families, in most, in most children's lives, there's some turmoil. There was a lot of turmoil in their, in their lives. 
But also remember too, in between those periods of stress, there's some calm, okay? And it's kind of that ebb and that flow of the daily cycle in which children develop. So even if there's something going on in the family or the culture or the society, nonetheless, development still proceeds. One theme that you're going to see run through this uh, presentation is I want to emphasize how environmental impacts child development. The environmental influences make a difference. Now, you know, a lot of psychologists would look at me in the present time and say, but wait a minute. What about biology? Doesn't biology influence children? Sure. Sure. In fact, the geneticist would tell me, well, of course, look, kids are come into the world with certain talents or predispositions that, you know, certainly seem to have some genetic basis. That's true. And I'm not saying that isn't so. But I am saying, too, that the environment makes a huge impact also, that it has a role to play. Some of those environmental influences, you saw that in the novel, family community, society. You know, sometimes we have the tendency to lump all these things together. Well, it's the environment that influences. Well, what do you mean? What is the environment? Yes, the family is important. I think most of us would agree to that. But you know, the family, as we'll see in a minute, is embedded within a community. And that community is embedded within a society. And certainly you see all of these different layers influencing the child and it makes an important impact on the child. So that's another very important idea. Let's take a little bit closer look at the novel. Take a look at some of the things that were influencing Jem, Scout, and we'll even talk about Dill. You know, you look at Jem and Scout, and they were embedded within a family. And certainly, one of the members of that family was Atticus. What an interesting father, okay? A very caring father. A father who was, as we'll say, a little bit contemplative, very thoughtful, but he tried to do the best for his children, kind of like what most parents try to do. They work with what they have, and they try to give their kids the best. That's what most parents want, and that's what they try. They may realize their shortcomings, Atticus recognized his, but nonetheless, he put his best foot forward. You know, another important person in this whole process was Calpurnia. You know, when Aunt Alexandra came on the scene, what an interesting character. She wanted to minimize the role of Cal. And it's interesting how Atticus jumped in, and he said, no, we can't. Cal is an important person. Now, you know, in the southern U.S. at that time, her role was downplayed. She was the hired hand. And yet Atticus recognized she was an important influence. That given that their mother had died some time back, Cal served as the mother in that family. And she took those kids as her own, and she raised them. She wasn't necessarily easy on them. She wasn't hard on them. But she provided a motherly influence. So she's a very important person in this whole dynamic. It's interesting, too, when Aunt Alexandra comes on the scene, because you see the influence of what she's bringing. You know, she wants to raise Scout as the little girl, right? She wants Scout to be in dresses and that. Scout is resisting it. Atticus is resisting it. Aunt Alexandra, too, wants to restore the family's dignity, if you will, or prominence. So she has an impact on the family, too. Now, they may not accept everything she says. They may go about their way. But nonetheless, she has an influence. The neighbors have a role. They have a role in every kid's life. Even in our lives, you think about the neighbors. Now, sometimes we have a tendency just to think, well, they're the neighbors. But you know, those neighbors many times give us ideas. They help families out. They also provide a structure. I mean, look at Boo, for instance. Boo, as you know. Uh, you know, presented the kids with endless hours of imaginatory, imagine, of imagine, 
of imagination, of activities, right? I mean, certainly, his house, the kids didn't know what was inside. It was interesting. It was intriguing. And they wondered who was putting the gum in the tree. Take a look at Miss Maudie. You know, she's an interesting character. She's part of the society, but she's kind of a little bit outside it, right? She has very interesting ideas. You know, certainly she's in her garden all the time. Some of the people thought she was too interested in her flowers. That was a bad thing. And she's also making the kids cake all of the time. She's very much a different type of woman for, her, uh, for the period. And she has a very formative influence on the kids. Take a look at Miss, I hope I say her name right, Miss Du Bois. And certainly she has a, a very important influence on the kid's life. You know, when you first read about her, and she says some really nasty things about Atticus, it's interesting because the kids are right away ready. Jem and Scout are ready to go after her. Atticus tempers them. And later you find out she's sick, she was addicted to morphine, it's caused some nasty things. But remember, those kids had to go there for a period of a several months to read to her constantly. And how that made a big impression on them. And how Atticus finishes the story after she passes away. And surprisingly, I must, mean, I must admit, I was even shocked when he says, she's a hero because she fought the fight, you know. And so it's a very interesting, a formative experience. And you simply ask yourself, would the kids have gotten that experience had the neighbors not been there? No. The neighbors are providing a context, and everyone grows up with neighbors. The school. Look at the impact the school had. Little Scout goes to school. She knows how to read. She reads well. And what does the teacher say? What would you expect the teacher to say? Oh, good job. But what does the teacher say? You're learning too much. You're reading too much. And the message goes home that, you know what? Don't let her read so much. Now, that doesn't happen, but that's a formative experience. You know, for a while, it sours Scout's impression of school. But nonetheless, Atticus, once again, that important factor in the whole equation, the father, one of the important factors, tells her how to think about it. The community. Macomb County. I don't know a whole lot about the South, but I think Harper Lee did a pretty good job of suggesting that this was a very typical community, a typical society in the southern U.S. in the 1930s. And you see, it's a small town. There's racial division. There's tension. It's interesting, you know. People are told how to act, how to behave, where to go, where not to go. But, you know, there's not complete ease with the whole situation. And certainly that has a formative experience. The kids talk about it. They lived with it. They've experienced it. And so certainly that, too, is an important area of their life, an important layer. And then there is society, the laws, the customs of people, the norms, what's expected. And those can transcend even the community. This goes out in a larger region. What you can do, what you can't do. And that's another layer. So all of these pieces are influencing child development. And they do in every kid's life. It's just the particular time or the particular place in which you live. These may be similar, they may be different, and they all interact with one another. So there's lots of layers here. Now somebody in psychology, well known, talks about this whole issue. Talks about how children are born in an environment with layers. The the person's name is Bronfenbrenner, a tongue twister of a name. But he was very prominent in American psychology. 
He talked in term, he formulated a theory of ecological systems and talked about the importance of environment in a child's life. In fact, if you look at his own life, he was an immigrant from Russia, came here at an early age around the turn of the last century, was educated here in the States, upstate at Cornell, also was educated at the University of Michigan and came back to uh, and studied at Cornell and taught at Cornell for a number of years. He also helped to formulate the Head Start program in this country and certainly was on a number of the President's advisory councils. So his theory, his practice, his teaching, his research all reflected the importance of the environment. And he basically says, look, the developing child is embedded in a series of complex and interactive systems. And I think that's something very nice to see, that each of these layers interact with one another. I think parents quickly find this out when they have a kid. And as you have your child, you try to instill certain values or beliefs. And then as the child gets older, the child wanders out into the world. And what does the kid begin to do? Question. And then you as a parent have to explain your own thoughts, your own ideas to your child and why you chose those ideas. The other thing I'd like to point out is I have this diagram here. You'll see it in a minute as it'll be elaborated. You may say, well, it looks like a bullseye. Well, it's not a bullseye, but rather think of it as concentric circles. Because what you have here, you have the child in the middle, if you will, and you have all different influences on the child's life and those influences are impacting the child, okay? And that's why I think that illustration, which you always see together with Bronfenbrenner's theory, is so informative. If you look at Bronfenbrenner's theory and the way it's illustrated, this is a common illustration. This is my own illustration, but you'll see something very much like it all over the web, in books, in textbooks. And you'll see the child is embedded, once again, in all of these layers. And Bronfenbrenner goes through and he suggests the child is impacted by something he calls the microsystem and the mesosystem and the exosystem and the macro system and the chrono system, okay? Now before I go any further, let me say one thing. I've always had an interest in Bronfenbrenner's theory. I teach about it and I teach it in class and certainly I find it interesting. I've never done any research on it though and I'll tell you why. A lot of people look at his theory and you know what they'll say? It's messy. Why is it messy? Well, you got all these layers here. And what are they doing? They're interacting with one another. And those people are right. It is messy. But I think it's a great theory because it illustrates how many times looking at the environment and the influences the environment has is messy. Sometimes it's difficult to tease one thing apart from another. But nonetheless, nonetheless, this is what child development is like. It's not necessarily a straight path. There are lots of things impacting a child. Let's take a look at his first level. Here's the first level, the next ring, if you will, that impacts the child's development. And this ring, ladies and gentlemen, the impact, if you will, is from the microsystem. What's the microsystem? People and objects in an individual's immediate environment. People and objects in an individual's immediate environment, okay? Who are some of these individuals? Well, parents and the children. Notice how they influence one another. You know, sometimes we typically say parents think when they first have a child that the relationship will be something like, I say, you do. And after about the first week of life when that child is born, you begin to realize it's more like I suggest and hopefully you do, okay? 
The parent keeps the upper hand, but you know a lot of times the child will lead you to change a bit. And certainly when people have two, three children, they begin to see this. One child will take instruction very well, will take discipline very well, and the other child, well, they give the parent gray hairs, okay? Because everything is up for grabs with that other kid. And so there's this dynamic interaction going on. And it's always in flux, okay? It's always moving around depending upon who's the parent and who's the kid. The family, the neighborhood are part of this microsystem along with the school. The school is part of this microsystem. You know, the school can either support or not what the parents are saying. And how many times, too, you look at these three things and they may be separate from one another, but they may support or not the influences. And the community. Another important influence, okay? You know, a lot of times, you know as well as I, when parents are choosing a place to live, they're interested in the four walls that will surround them, but what else are they going to be interested in? The neighborhood, where they're living, what are the people like? Do they like the neighborhood? Do they like the stores around there? It's an important layer. How about the mesosystem? The next layer, the next ring out, if you will, that Bronfenbrenner talks about. That microsystems connect with one another. That the family influences the neighborhood, the neighborhood influences the family, the community influences the neighborhood, the neighborhood influences the family, and you have this give and take, okay? There's always this interaction going on. All of these different types of microsystems are influencing one another, okay? They're not static, but rather they're connected. Here's a layer that I think is interesting. I think a lot of times we don't think about this as influencing a child, but it has a huge impact. And Bronfenbrenner talks about this. The exit system. Social settings, a person may not experience firsthand. So think about the child. The child is experiencing something, not necessarily firsthand, but it's having an impact on their life. Here's the classic example. Work-related issues, work-related stressors can impact a child's life, okay? If you have a job and your boss isn't so great and every day you, the parent, are coming home, are you in a good mood or bad mood? You're in a bad mood. And a lot of times, whether you don't want to or not, who suffers? The child. Not necessarily saying you're doing something awful to the child, but are you as happy, playful, joyful with that kid than if you had had a very nice boss? Probably not. And so this is the classic example that something from the job creeps into the home life, okay? It's not even in the child's radar, if you will. They're not in this layer, but nonetheless, it's impacting the child. Let's go back to the book again. Oh, there are some great examples there. How were layers outside of the child are impacting their lives. Here's one. On the job, the defense offered by Atticus on the case had an indirect effect on Scout and Jem. They were pointed out and harassed. They were harassed at school, even in the family, remember? Remember Christmas Day? They went to Finch's Landing and that little kid Francis pulled Scout aside 
and says, here's what we think about your dad and his work defending Tom Robinson. I'll tell you in all the language glory. Here you go. Take it. Now, what does Scout do? She's upset. If you remember, she's not even sure about all of this. She goes to Atticus, and Atticus has to clarify and explain things. Now, think about it. That wasn't even in Scout's radar. This was not something she was even thinking about. But nonetheless, Francis brought it to her attention. A layer, an environmental impact that was indirect, but ultimately made a very direct impact on her life. Here's another example. I don't know, I kind of like the neighbor next door. I like Boo. A little unusual, a little bizarre, but I must admit, when he stuck the gum in the tree, I thought it was brilliant. Because you could see it made the kids guess. And you know, a lot of times adults do that, right? You know, when they like a kid, for instance, they'll do some, you know, very silly things. But remember, Boo's life, in a sense, was not a direct impact, okay? Boo chose to live his life, as most people do, thinking about himself or herself. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it still had an impact on the child's life. And in fact, notice how it made for endless summer conversation. They had to go on the expedition at night, where ultimately Jem ran into some problems. But nonetheless, this was an impact also. And I think Bronfenbrenner would look at this and say, it's part of the exosystem. And that's what Lee documents so nicely, that this has an impact on the child's life. Any questions so far? Macro systems, another layer. Now remember, we're moving out away from the child. We're going out further and further. But these macro systems have an impact. Subcultures, cultures in which the child lives. Now, you know, certainly each one of us can look at our own life. And I think we can find some commonality. You and I live within embedded cultures. You know, certainly, everyone here has some type of ethnic identity, okay? People have customs within their families. A great time to explore that when somebody says, today is a holiday for me. And then you ask, so what do you do? Well, here's what my family does. And even if you're celebrating the same holiday as somebody else, you know that there are different customs, different rituals that are associated with it. There's a regional culture. People live differently in certain parts of the country. You certainly see that in the book. Lee is uh, documenting how people in the southern U.S. lived in the 1930s. Even today it's common. If you don't believe me, drive 150 miles away from New York, City, New York City in any direction and you'll experience a very different regional culture because you'll step foot out of your car, you'll go into the gas station to buy some gas, you'll pay for it, and the clerk will say to you, so how are you today? And you'll say, well, why do you want to know? And that New York attitude comes right out. But nonetheless, it's a different culture. And certainly, there's a different national identity, okay? That from one country to the next, there's another cult, there's a culture that envelops people. All these different layers. And certainly what Lee has suggested in the book, and Bronfenbrenner would support also, these are interacting with one another, they're influencing one another. The last layer that certainly Bronfenbrenner talks about are something he refers to as chronosystems. Now, frankly, I'll tell you, I think this is probably one of the hardest layers to understand of his theory. But I think the one way that you can make some sense out of it is simply he'll say, that these systems change over time, okay? The systems change over time. Let's take a look at the family. Do you ever notice how the system within a family changes as a child develops? Do you remember this in the book? You know, there's one very, uh, uh, very nice example how Jem, Scout, and Atticus had this nice relationship, how they interacted with one another. 
And all of a sudden, Jem is getting older. And Scout can't understand what's going on. You know the first thing that happens. Jem feels it's his place now to tell Scout everything she needs to know. And Scout, frankly, doesn't like that. There's another example there, too, where Jem is getting older. He goes out to hang out with Dill. Scout wants to tag along, and the two boys don't want her. And what does the father say? What does Atticus say? Give her space. Give him space, okay? He's growing. He's developing. He'll want to be alone. That's a nice example of how the family changes. But certainly, society changes. And certainly, if you'd go back to this southern county, Macomb County, if it exists, or some county like it, things would probably be a little bit different today. Yes, there'd be some similarity, a lot of differences. What I'd like to do now is fast forward a little bit. Take a look at some contemporary issues in the study of children, in the study of human growth and development, and see how the book stacks up to some common wisdom that we like to suggest comes from the research. You know, in the year 2012, we will say many times the family has a very important role. You'll see that talked about in most textbooks. I think most people will probably agree with that. And you know, people will go through and they'll say, well, what are some of the characteristics of a good family? What makes one better than perhaps another in terms of interactional style? And they'll say, well, a family in which people listen and ask questions, particularly the parents. If you go back to the book, Atticus was good at doing that. He was quiet, but nonetheless, he was able to listen. He asked questions of the children, and the children, in respond, did the same thing, in response to the same thing. Does the family have a sense of respect and concern for one another? Certainly, you're going to have disagreements, but is there, there's some mutual respect. I think you saw that. Notice how Atticus was interested in talking to the kids. He would talk to them. He would mention things. He wouldn't necessarily always agree to them, but he guided them. Here's a common one that you hear today. Now, you may say, well, why did I put this up there? In 1930, you didn't have video games. You didn't have TV. You had radio. That was about it. Because I think the idea here is, know what your kids are doing. And certainly you could suggest that Atticus had a good hold on what his kids were doing. So did Cal. And certainly they made a difference in their kids' lives. Okay? Positive parental relationships. We also see that a lot of time mentioned. Make sure that your child has good role, a good role model. And the other thing that's always mentioned, know who your kids are playing with, okay? Positive role models. And certainly you see that in the book, there were positive role models for those children. And certainly Atticus, Cal, were very knowledge knowledgeable on where the kids were and what they were doing, even when they snuck out of the house and didn't tell them. So these are things that we always mention today based upon the research, things you should do, but in addition, these are things I think you see reflected in the book. Let me put this slide up. I want you to take a look at it. There's a huge current today in the research that says, a secure parental-child relationship has some very positive outcomes. And I think if you look at the book, the kids had a nice, secure relationship. And it's important because there are outcomes. First of all, we notice there are better peer relationships. The book demonstrates that. The kids interacted well with one another. They interacted well with Dill, even with Francis, who wasn't the most pleasant kid. And certainly people will say, well, why? Because the parent is modeling for the child. The parent is showing the child how to have a good relationship. 
Overall, these kids will have lower levels of depression and anxiety. Okay? We know that from a lot of data, and certainly important, because you want your kid to be able to function well. And certainly, even as a child gets older, and even during adolescence, when that kid begins to pull away a bit, it's still important. There's less delinquency. Delinqu delinquency can mean getting in trouble with the law or just doing inappropriate actions based upon societal norms. Better social skills, interacting with other people. You know, that's clearly an important skill that kids need because certainly you and I are embedded in a social world. Kids who have better, secure, more securely attached to their parents are more going to have a greater tendency to be outgoing. We used to say extroverted, willing to interact with other people. Not necessarily obnoxious, but just in, they're interacting with others. And a very important thing that people will always pay attention to, more success academically. What are we talking about here? We could be talking about achievement, how well you do with reading, writing, school performance, grades, okay? So we have what Lee presents us with is a nice family, secure attachments are fostered with Atticus and the kids, with Cal and the kids, and certainly by their behaviors, I think you can see these qualities reflected in their behavior. I have a couple more things to talk about and I want to give you something to think about because we see a lot about the parent-child relationship in the book and it may strike you as a little bit odd but the data tells us quite loud and clear that an ideal parent-child relationship is one with some conflict. Now when you say conflict people say well that must be bad the kids aren't listening. No it's not necessarily the kids aren't listening but there's an exchange of ideas there's communication here. It's not necessarily that the kids are now listening or that the parents are giving up control. It's the fact that they may not like something and they're willing to discuss it with their parents and their parents may or may not agree with them. Notice in the book how Atticus and the kids talked quite frequently. Even notice how Cal talked with the kids. It maybe was a different interaction style than you see in 2012, but there was communication here. It wasn't just I say you do. They would discuss ideas, they would interact. Another important comment. A relationship that maintains a level of closeness. You know, I think the scene at the end of the book was a great scene. You know, Jem has his arm broken. Frankly, it seemed like the, it was a bit dislodged. And Atticus is staying with this kid, who this kid is clearly an adolescence. He's not a little boy any longer. And yet Atticus is staying there, and not only that, he takes some time to even tuck Scout in. And certainly what this says is even when kids get older, even when they're as big as their parents, there is still some closeness there that should be maintained. It may change, but it should be maintained. And something too, a relationship that changes over time. And I think you saw that in the book. As the kids got older, they were more willing to interact with Atticus and Atticus, Atticus was more willing to have them interact with him. And sometimes I know this can be a challenge, parents will many times say, because all of a sudden, your kid is now looking at you straight in the eye and asking you questions. But nonetheless, it's one that has to change. And one other point on this issue, an ideal parent-child relationship is not necessarily a friendship. 
A friend is one who you can confide in. A friend is not necessarily one that tells you what to do or to offer instruction or direction. They can. But certainly, we always say don't be a friend to your child. The data tells us that because sometimes the kid will not like you and they may not be your friend at that point in time. But that's not the role of a parent. A parent is there most of the time to direct. And certainly Atticus did that, Cal did that. If you've ever taken a class in psychology, child development, you'll know some other topics that will be discussed. What should the parents be like? Now think about this in terms of the book. Think about this in terms of how Atticus, Jem, and Scout interacted with one another. How was Atticus? Was he a dictator? No, he was not a dictator. Now perhaps you know some parents who are dictators. Okay? That's the parent, the classic example. They say something, the child does. No questioning, no communication. I tell you, that's it. End of story. What we typically find from the literature is yes, there's high control, little warmth, but it's not the best relationship because it tends to close down the lines of communication. And that's something you want to maintain. Here's the best one. That's why it's nicely colored in yellow. We say it's the authoritative one. An authoritative parent maintains control, but they also have some warmth and they maintain communication. They don't let their kid do whatever the kid wants to do or their children, whatever their children want to do, but they will direct the situation and yet at the same time, they show some love, okay? Here's one that doesn't work well. Here's one that was not prominent in the book either. The permissive parent. The permissive parent is warmth and caring but no control. You did not see that. It wasn't good then. It isn't good now. The data keeps telling us permissive parenting is not the ideal. Certainly kids want discipline. They need it in their lives. They need structure. And certainly I think this title kind of gives it away that it's not one of the best ones. Uninvolved. No warmth, no caring, no direction, okay? It's not good for a child. I think what you see from the book is that you have quite a nice family there. It's not a family who was without problems. They didn't live in a perfect society by any means. And there was a lot of conflict. But in the midst of all the problems, in the midst of all of the issues, they were able to maintain that family dynamic and they were able to raise those kids successfully. And so certainly I think it's a nice model and certainly it is a nice example of how children do develop over time embedded with these systems. Now, I'm about through with my presentation, but I'd be happy to talk about, to answer any questions that you have. I have a question. Go ahead. We have taken a look uh, at the and Jim. Mm -hmm. With this information, I found it very interesting. But I'm wondering if you have any insight into the character of Bill. You know, it's an interesting uh, question. I, I had some sympathy for Dill. And I'll tell you what I found, I, I, found bad, I found it to be sad for him. When his mother got remarried, and he found it difficult. And I thought, it shows a great example how a kid a lot of times has difficulty when the family situation changes. From one way to the other for whatever reason. And I thought, what you see here is a kid who has this, his family microstructure, if you will, is changing dr dramatically. And where does he go? He goes back to a stable atmosphere. He goes back to Jem's house, to Scott's house, to spend the summer or at least a day or two. 
So I think he provides a nice example of how kids do like constancy and they do like routine and that when something is disrupted, the kid experiences problems. But just like Dill, he seemed to overcome it with time, okay? With a little help from his parents and his friends and relatives. Yeah. And when a parent, I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, I think that that was so much about what Kent Scout, in the midst of chaos, what Kent Scout wasn't just the authority of the parent, but they could, the, the child saw that the parent was seeing something that was more stable than the chaos. I mean, well, that's you know. Where that, made, where that was a bit clearer for me, and I guess what I thought was a nice example, is when they went to Miss Du Bois' house, and at first Jem goes there, he cuts all of the flowers down to show her that he didn't like, or he didn't like what she had called the father, okay? And clearly, you know, you're sitting with Jem and you're saying, good for you, on one hand. But then you're surprised, they go home, and what does Atticus do? Not only does he scold them for doing that, now they have to go sit with this woman and help her out. And I think at that point, you see Scout questioning what it is that Atticus is doing. And certainly, you're almost there on Scout's side. But I think what's so interesting, they go spend time with this woman, time after time, and she's not the nicest of women either. And then at the very end, after she passes away, it's almost as if Atticus knows they're questioning his reason for having them do that. And so what does he do? Lee takes about a page, page and a half, to tell you about the narrative, about how they're being told why he did that, why it was so important, why she was a strong person, and that her outward behavior didn't reflect necessarily what was inside. And even if it did, he tells them to ignore that, that that's not right, but you have to get past that. So I think I applaud Atticus for doing that, because as a parent, I think sometimes you struggle with that. I think he took the time to enact something. Mm -hmm. that even though the child was struggling with, what is that all about? It kind of gave them a, a place to see mm -hmm. this kind of anger or injustice from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a nice piece. I think, too, at the end of the trial, when he explains to them very carefully the legal system and why he did what he did, I thought it was a great piece. I thought it shows how his concern for the kids and having them understand at a different level, which is always a challenge to, uh, as a parent, but he did it well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was no wonderful. Problem.